So we are now recording um, and we will post the meeting recording also on Let's Talk Houston. Um, if you have not already, visit the Let's Talk Houston page to sign up for our newsletter and I'll drop that in the chat as well to sign up for Sunnyside or any of the other communities if you'd like to be in the know of when their meetings are, what they have going on and to get our newsletter monthly. So it's a good resource to kind of open some lines of communication. So is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? Or, and is there anyone from any um, elected office or other departments that want to say hello before we kick things off? Not everybody at once. <laughs> Hi, Lindsay. This is Desmond uh, from Council Member Karen Levin Shabazz's office. Um, I put the message in the chat, uh, but of course, Stephen is on today. But, um, you know, if anyone needs to reach out to me, my email is in the chat group, desmond.calloway at houstontx.gov. Of course, again, Director of Communications for Carol, Council Member Carolyn Levin Shabazz. <laughs> Did you get it? You got off. Yeah. Good. Thanks for joining. It's virtual. So first, let's start off. Everyone will try to say muted if unless you're talking. If you um, need to use the if you would like to speak, you can use the hand raise feature and I don't mind calling on anyone. Um, also use the chat feature if there is a presentation happening and you have some a thought that you maybe want on record or don't want to forget <laughs> while while it's talking you can also put your questions um, and remarks in there so I just want everyone this is an open community meeting I my vision for the Sunnyside Complete Communities is that this is a place where we can all come and collaborate and hear the great updates that are happening um, hear from stakeholders connect and make these things a reality in some cases and really keep the sun shining in Sunnyside so this is open I'm, I'm Anybody is free to, to make any comments, but I do ask that we all um, remain respectful of each other. We've never had that issue, but I just want to put that disclaimer out there. So, is there anyone else that needs to do an introduction before we move forward? Hey, Lindsay, um, I was on another call, so I think that I missed the introduction part, but I'm Shelby Mims. Hi, Shelby. Okay, so we're gonna gonna just briefly go over the agenda. We're gonna kick it off with an exciting community update of an event that happened a couple weeks ago, sampling the city um, with Air Alliance. Then we'll move on to Houston Public Works. Um, they're gonna give us a presentation about the sidewalk program and how we can get involved with that. We'll then have um, a local resident that leads the Young Community and Culture Group. She applied for a list grant and was awarded, so congratulations. And she's kicking off a stop dumping campaign. So she'd like to talk to you all about how to get involved and what that will entail. And, oh, I can't even remember how many months back, but a few months back, we created this initiative. Um, I sit on the board of AIA, which is American Institute of Architects, as well as NOMA, which is National Organization of Minority Architects, teamed up um, with the Complete Communities and Community Initiative for Designing which was amazing. And Sunnyside was lucky to have two teams that created these um, really incredible design solutions that they're going to present to you tonight for um, the Sunnyside area. And I would like us as a community to talk about implementation strategies. How do we move these things to the next level uh, from design to reality. University is also very uh, here to talk to us about the Healthy Houston Initiative. I think it's very exciting um, for the local things they have going on in the Sunnyside community, as well as a great avenue to connect with them um, for your local efforts as well. And we have a few community announcements. 
We'll hear from I Believe Farms about the Juneteenth celebration. We will hear from Worthing High School about the COVID vaccines initiative they have going on. And we will hear from um, South Union CDC about their stream camp. And any other community announcements, if you have them, we can also um, discuss those at the end of this. And we have exciting updates from the Houston Public Library in your area. So as you can see, we have um, a ton of things to talk through tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and start it off and I will hand it over to that. Well, no, anyone from, I guess Shelby, Deborah Walker, Didi Young, or uh, Ephraim, if you'd like to speak about the airlines air effort, the sampling the city. Okay, hello everyone. Hello. Uh, this is Deborah Walker. And I wanna thank you, uh, Lindsay, for coming out to the uh, air sampling uh, uh, event that we had on June the 5th. It was a great event. It turned out real um, real nice. Uh, the weather was uh, hot, but it wasn't raining. That was a good thing. And um, we partner with um, the community, Sunnyside Community Redevelopment Organization, which is I'm the president of. And um, um, I think a civic club, Crestmont Civic Club. And um, we all partner with Air Alliance. And um, what we were doing was going out into the community to do air sampling about the air pollution that's in our um, community that we don't know nothing about. And as you may have heard me talk about air monitors on, um, around in Sunnyside, this was a good project for us to do, work together with Air Alliance was to see where most of the um, uh, air pollution is, uh, most of the uh, particular matter, the VOCs um, could be around in the neighborhood. So what Air Alliance did, they sponsor uh, 15 monitors and um, we had the volunteer to wear those monitors that day. Uh, we did, uh, we had three projects we were working on. One was a one mile uh, walk around the track there at Sunnyside Park. And the other one was take a three mile hike on with bicycles to, um, um, what's this called, Sunny, Sunnyside Stream? Um, the, uh, a little project of the solar farm with Ephraim Jernick and he may be on online and uh, did all that. And then we did the uh, six mile uh, van ride to the hills of Sims at uh, Scott and Airport. And so um, we walked around, we walked uh, around the trail at um, Sunnyside Park. We did like a half a mile down and a half a mile coming back, which was, which ended up being a mile. And so we picked up some VOCs, but it was real low um, uh, for that, you know, for the area. And I guess because of the trees was out there, the trees, the greenery might have something to do with it and everything. But uh, most of the environmentals list that was out there was saying that it was pretty low, uh, but like 12, 11 or 12, the particular matter was also a little low. And um, those are some of the issues that we be dealing with in our community that we know nothing about. We can't hardly see the particular matter, but sometimes you might be breathing and you can feel something that come in your nose or something or eat through your mouth. And sometimes that's what particular matter is. It's, it's a, a combustion of dust, soot that's from the community. And sometimes it gets in our lungs and, you know, causes us to have lung problems and other uh, allergies and uh, respiratory issues. So that was one of the reasons why we partnered with them to see, you know, how um, they picked up um, the air was in, uh, in Sunnyside. So um, 
if anybody else on it want to give, you know, reiterate what, what else we did, I'm going to give them some room. Shelby, that's all you Oh, yeah, no. Um, I think that Ms. Walker gave um, a really great um, overview. And then um, there's going to be a Zoom call um, just to report back um, everything that we found on the air monitors. And I will put that information in the chat because I don't know the date and the time uh, from the top of my head, but I'll put that in the chat. Okay. If you could drop the link. So I think there is a June 20 follow up that was posted on the airline site. And you can sign up for the 1230 meeting or the 630 meeting. Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah, it's right here on the screen. Sorry. <laughs> yes, that's the follow up. That's the Zoom. Uh, meeting that we will report back um, what we found in the area. So at so like during the six mile bike ride, the three mile bike ride and the walk, um, we will report back what we found. And then we'll also send that information to TZEQ as we advocate for more or for air monitors in the community. Wonderful. Thank you. And just so you all know, Shelby is also a, a sunny side resident as well and helped um, essentially lead and organize the sampling the city. We want to hey, see Lizzie, you have someone in the chat. Um, Carol, she wants to know how often this, this is done. Um, this was uh, really just a one time thing, but we can do it um, often. Um, yeah, so we can definitely like work with the community and all of us to do it uh, more. But uh, this was originally planned as just a one time event. Awesome, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to, um, wait, first I just wanna make sure if there are any um, directors or public officials that signed on a little later that did not get a chance to say hello, feel free to do so at this time before we move forward. Hi everyone, this is Shannon Bugs, Director of the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities. It's wonderful to see you all here this evening. Thank you, Lindsay, for having that pause. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for joining. Okay. So I'm going to pass it over. Um, Valerie, feel free to share your screen. She's going to talk to us about the Houston Public Works Sidewalk Program. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Let me just get my screens all organized here. Um, okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, my name is Valerie Luna. I am with the Houston Public Works Department, um, the Transportation and Drainage Operations Service Line. And within that service line, I am with Project Delivery. <laughs> I, I know that that's a mouthful. Um, and my section is responsible um, for the uh, sidewalk program. And I'm also joined tonight by my colleague Angel Bonte um, with the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. He will also uh, be taking a moment during the presentation to, to speak um, as well tonight. So our sidewalk program aims to construct new sidewalks and ramps along streets leading to schools, along major thoroughfares, and for people with disabilities to improve accessibility. Um, our sidewalk program is governed by our code of, our code of ordinances, um, and I will put the link in the chat at the end of the presentation for anybody who wants to go and take a look at that ordinance. So we have three program types, school, major thoroughfare, and the pedestrian accessibility review, which Angel is going to speak a little bit more about. Okay, great, this slide looks good. Um, you Sometimes the slide cuts off <laughs> and it doesn't show all the information, but that looks good. Okay, um, so again, our three program types um, for the pedestrian accessibility review, 
Um, it is up to uh, 1,500 feet. And again, Angel's going to talk about that a little, bo a little bit more in a second. Um, our school um, is new sidewalks and ramps up to four blocks. Um, used, it must be used by students um, to walk to school, um, not around a school perimeter. So any sidewalks that are immediately abutting a school property, um, it does not qualify. Um, and is not at a Denon Street, and there is no existing sidewalk. Again, our program aims to build new sidewalks where there are none. Four major thoroughfares, very similar, up to four blocks um, along a designated thoroughfare. Uh, no existing sidewalk, as evidence of pedestrian traffic, um, and no planned future construction for improvement. The areas must have accessible existing right of way with no ditches, slopes, um, drastic slopes, uh, large tree roots, fences, walls, or obstructions. Um, we just don't have it in our budget to put a full design together, design plans, and, and bring on a designer um, for major obstructions. Um, so that's why we look for adequate existing right of way that we can work within. So I am going to go ahead and pass um, the mic, a uh, virtual mic over to Angel and I will run the slides for you, Angel. All right, let me catch that mic. Got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as you know, my name is Angel Ponce. And so a lot of the work that I do within the mayor's office for people with disabilities is work with our residents with disabilities and seniors uh, to make sure to enhance their opportunities to, to um, be able to engage in their community. And so the PARP program was created with those uh, needs in mind, right? People with disabilities. Um, and, and that's to say that the city of Houston takes priority over these requests. Uh, so who qualifies and what are the eligibility requirements for the PARP program? So residents that have a disability or, or residents that are acting on behalf of people with disabilities are eligible for the program. Um, so how do you report these? Uh, to report, uh, residents are encouraged to contact our office um, if they encounter any problems of uh, safe, safe, uh, safe path of travels to, to the bank, uh, to the bus stop, to their education facility, employment, to the pharmacy, uh, even to uh, try to get into their homes um, uh, through the sidewalk in front of their property or to get to their vehicles in the front of the property, um, to medical facility and their place of worship. Uh, so you may be able to see that on the screen uh, two images, um, a before and after photo. This is actually uh, a sidewalk that I worked a couple of years ago it is a kind of extreme example, but nonetheless, this is something that uh, our office sees all the time. Next slide. And so the um, application process is pretty easy. Uh, residents are encouraged to visit our website uh, for the online application at houstontx.gov forward slash disabilities. And I'll make sure and drop that into the chat box um, or request the application by mail. Um, in some cases, uh, we're able to do the application process over the phone when the resident is not connected to the internet um, because we understand that, that that's an issue um, in, in some of our neighborhoods uh, or is not able to uh, fill out the application for themselves. Uh, then an MOPD representative will contact the resident and schedule an in-person appointment to visit the, not just the part uh, site, but to discuss with the resident, uh, make contact with the resident and make sure that the resident understands that we're there to support them with their uh, accessibility issues. Uh, we do gather as much data as possible um, to make sure that the, the request does meet the requirements for the program. And I'll make sure um, that uh, I also drop in in the chat box our phone number for anybody that is interested in getting a uh, paper copy of the application or we can help you fill it out. Next slide. Okay, so as briefly stated before on the previous slide, um, the MOPD will review the findings, then provide the best possible recommendations to Houston Public Works. Uh, we always inform residents that just because 
uh, we made a recommendation to public works does not mean that the work will be done. Um, that is to say that a public works representative, after we submit our recommendations, will provide an additional examination of the site and then determine if the sidewalk is constructible. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, after the uh, MOPD has conducted the review, uh, provided recommendations, and, um, and, and, and a Houston Public Works representative has approved the, the project, it then moves forward into the design team. Uh, this process can sometimes take a couple of months uh, to a few months and sometimes a little longer, but especially when the order is new and it requires uh, council approval. However, if the location is old with little to no obstructions and no pushback from residents, the work begins as soon as possible. Thank you, Angel. Um, so to initiate the process, the sidewalk program process and the PAR process um, requires a submittal of an application. From there, we go into our approval phase. Um, again, there is guideline vetting um, where we make sure that the application meets all the criteria. And then we also conduct a field vetting to make sure that it's constructible. And then we go into our next phase, implementation, which is essentially the department constructing the project. The length of time uh, between a request um, for the new sidewalk construction depends on the type of request, um, available program funding, um, and number of requests received. Um, so we do process the applications as they are received. So it's going to have some type of status to it right off the back, whether it needs to be vetted, um, whether it needs to be field vetted, or whether it's ready for construction. So those, there's always going to be some type of status um, to it. Um, and one quick note as well, um, application recommendations that come from the mayor's office of people with disability gets priority over those that come, uh, those applications that come to us through the um, regular process. Um, so construction authorization notices will be sent out um, to your council member's office, to the office um, of, to the mayor's office of people with disabilities. On that note, there will be um, information uh, about location, project scope, the expected start and end date, inf uh, contact information for our project manager and the contractor. So uh, those who are impacted, that will be impacted by the project, um, you will either get something in your mailbox, a letter in your mailbox, or a door hanger on your door. Um, so, and we also rely on the council member's office to um, spread the word, to help us spread the word about projects in their in their districts. Um, so you may also see something through their social media um, or other resources that they may be using about construction. So really quickly, here is your sidewalk team. Um, the, the team is not on the line tonight. Um, it is just myself and Angel. Um, but Patricia Campbell is our managing engineer. Alvin Watts is our project technician. He's the one that reads y'all's applications. Uh, Bashar Khalil is our project manager. And Richard Hodgkins um, is our assistant project manager. So how to apply. Um, there are two ways. Um, you can visit our website and fill out an application there or, you, or by mail. Um, I can, uh, you can either contact me and I can mail you the application, you can mail it back, or you can print the application from the city website. And again, at the end of the presentation, I will put all the links in the chat box for everyone. So any, any questions? I'm actually gonna leave the how to apply information up for everyone, but um, we can have a, a quick q and I think I see some people in the chat box um, 
right on Rack Street. Oh yes, Rack Street. I think we just recently finished Rack Street, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so thank you for the kudos. Yes, hi Miss Hi Miss Luna, how you doing? Hi, hi. Miss Jackson, how are you? Yeah, this is me, Iva. Yeah, look, the sidewalks look great. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, um, and I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and read the question from the chat box if that's okay, Lindsay. For me to okay. Um, many neighborhoods have ditches in Sunnyside, especially around Attic Middle School. I always see students walking on the roads. This should raise safety awareness. This it, um this will be great for the school and surrounding areas. Yes, um, and we build up through four blocks to a school um for the high pedestrian uh way that travel way of travel that they are take the students are taking um so again i will post the link for the application and if you just fill it out we can vet it do i have some hands raised as well uh charles jr if you want to go ahead Uh, I think it's lighting up. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. If you're on a phone, it's star six to so unmute. No? Okay, Charles, we'll 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 come back to you. Um, Mary. Uh, yeah, my concern is here on Calhoun. We have um, kids. Well, when they go back to school. Bastion Addicts, there's a school bus that drops off on the corner of um, Cullen and Briscoe. There's a bunch of kids get off that bus and then all day long and half the night pedestrians. And the sidewalk just from my house to back towards Belf is horrible because I've walked it on the cool days. And you have to come off the sidewalk into the street because there's no sidewalk. It's all muddled up. And I'm concerned about the kids when they walk, you know, children just walk out in the street anyway, but there's no sidewalk when they even attempt to stay on the sidewalk. You have no choice but to get out into the street. That sidewalk needs to be repaired for sure from Briscoe at Calhoun going back to the Family Dollar Store, which is going south of Calhoun. Okay. Um, so I, I think I heard that there's some spots that there is no sidewalk so well um, yeah I, it's it's, it's kind of like gone okay so for for the areas that have no existing sidewalk i would encourage you to fill out an application for the areas where there is existing there is a sidewalk there and it needs repair mm -hmm. that does not qualify we only build new sidewalks Per our ordinance, the abutting property owner is responsible for the maintenance of the sidewalk. Oh, well, there's nobody there because they're empty lots. They're empty lots. Okay. Um, let's, let's, um, if you can shoot me um, an email or give me a call tomorrow, I'll put my contact information. Um, let's talk a little bit more. Um, it does get a little bit tricky when the lots are vacant or abandoned um but we might be able to to look into getting something some assistance um it, it it's just a longer a bit of a longer process hmm. okay thanks okay i'm just gonna go down the list uh tracy yes can you hear me yes uh, I have a couple couple of things. Uh, what is the backlog on your sidewalk program for location that has been approved like four or five years ago? So we currently don't have a backlog. Are is there a specific application you're you're pointing out to? Maybe we can connect after, and I can I can get you a status on on that. Well, I have uh, almost 15, 20 locations 
that I've got letters from the city that they will approve for, for new sidewalks where there weren't any sidewalks. So you saying that all of those approved letters, y'all just throw them away and the people wasn't informed that they'd have to reapply? So why would why would why would y'all why would y'all do that? And so a lot of people were notified that you wasn't going to recognize what's already been approved. So on those letters is a tracking number. If you send me those tracking numbers, I can find out what happened for all fifteen. <sighs> And again, I'll put my contact information um, in, in the chat box so we can connect um, after the meeting. And I, I'd be happy to look into those um, into those letters that you received. And also, since we're talking about the, the, the disability aspect of this, what about all of the existing sidewalks that are not accessible anymore, basically, the sidewalks and the ramps where people uh, still have to use the sidewalks and y'all only focusing on brand new sidewalks. You have more existing sidewalks that need work than you have places where you need to put sidewalks where there aren't any. So for, for those types of sidewalks, um, I encourage you to contact the mayor's office for people with disabilities. And I put some of uh, our contact information in the chat box, and I'm happy to speak to you more directly about how to uh, fill out an application so we can take a look at those sidewalks and, and curb cuts as well. Yeah, there's a bit more flexibility um, with the recommendations that we receive from the mayor's office of people with disabilities. Although there may be existing sidewalk or an existing ramp, um, we understand that the safety is a top priority and that's something that the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities look at. And so we have a bit more flexibility to um, be creative and um, when, with, the, with the constructability of, of the repairs that need to be made under, under that, under those recommendations. There was also a question in the chat. What if the sidewalk is owned by the city of Houston? So the so we own the city right away. That is correct. We have our city right away. And um, that is ours. If we were to conduct any maintenance within our city right away, we require you to visit with our Houston Permitting Center. Um, to get approved plans or or permits. However, um, the curb, gutter, and sidewalk area per one of our ordinances um, is the response maintenance responsibility of the abutting property owner, which means if you have a sidewalk in front of your home and it is crumbling, it's breaking, um, or it's not within compliance anymore, which means it's under uh, three, three feet in, in, in width, um, you would be responsible for hiring a contractor, pulling the permits, um, and getting permission from the Houston Permitting Center to conduct the repairs. So although it is our city right of way, um, per our ordinance, the, the, the property owner is responsible for the maintenance. And if the abutting property is owned by the city of Houston or vacant, they should contact you, correct? Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, for example, I believe it was in front of a police station. Um, oh, um, gosh, it seems like so long ago, but I think it was just sometime last year um, where the, the sidewalk needed some some work done. And yes, it, it, um, there's a facility management um, component here at the city for for facilities that are owned by by us. Have one more hand. My, my team does not necessarily make those repairs, but there is an entity within our within our um, within the city that is responsible for the maintenance of, of something like that. Okay, so if they reach out to you, you can connect them to. to yeah, those oh, for sure. And so, Miss um, Scott, I see your hand is raised. 
Hi, yes. So I, I asked the question about um, if it's owned by the city and I just want to make sure I understand. So I'm a resident in Sunnyside and also a small business owner of a behavioral management company. And so the sidewalk that I am visibly looking at that I see there's a bus stop with. I understand when you say it need, if it's connected to the property, it is the homeowner's responsibility. However, this sidewalk is separated by like it is in the middle of two city streets. There is no land attached to it other than the land that is the sidewalk. And then the other side of the, that sidewalk is Belford. So it's kind of like Belford sidewalk, Rosemont, my home. So I am not responsible for that sidewalk because it is more than three feet from my property. However, there is nothing else but street. And so I've called 311 because even like the maintenance of the median getting cut, it does not get cut. There are weeds that are taller than people walking by right now. So who and how, because and also that sidewalk is crumbling and it's a ramp to a bus stop. So when it rains, it's filled with mud. Um, individuals with disabilities or in wheelchairs have to get in the street and then get back on when it does heavily rain because they can't make it through. So who and what, which application should I use for that to be addressed? Because there isn't, there is no property or no resident to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So I would have to get my project manager or my assistant project manager out there to take a look at something like that. Um, so let, again, I'll, I'll put my contact information in the chat box and if you can connect with me um, sometime tomorrow or you know at your earliest convenience, um, we'll, we'll send somebody out there to take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, also, too, my name is Rashad K with the Department of Neighborhoods. If you do see a lot with high weeds and high grass, uh, you can always do a 311 request and turn that in, and that goes to the Department of Neighborhoods. And I mean, even if that's owned by a corporate entity, we can still try to address it. Good to know. And anything you um, send to the Department of Neighborhoods, our rep, and I don't know if her area has changed. Um, is really responsive, but you can always CC me and I can make sure that um, Dawn gets that information. And hi, it's good to see you. <laughs> it's okay. actually, if I, if I could interrupt really quickly, thank you, Mr. K, for oh. being on the call and, and putting that information out. Um, Ma'am, if you would not mind putting the address of this weeded lot in the chat, we can go ahead and take a, a preliminary look at that now. So that's the that's the tricky part. There isn't an address. It is it is the it is like a second median almost, if you will. So I can give you my address because it's directly it is. A, it's so hard to explain. Even 311 has difficulty when I try to put in this report, but. There is no lot. It is. Street sidewalk street my home okay why don't you no no no. it's fine why don't you do this and that means we may need to just have someone come out there and meet with you um if you don't mind send an email to us at um we'll we'll put the uh the information in the chat but contact don okay at houstontx.gov Don as in D-A-W-N or Don D-O-N? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, my apologies. Don D-O-N. Okay. D-O-N. I'm sorry. At HoustonTX.gov. And just a reminder that you were on this call so that we'll, we'll know and we'll get someone out there to probably one of our inspections teams to come out there. Or better yet, um, send your, your phone number as well to that email. If you could send that tonight, we'll have someone out there by next week to reach out I, to you and then you can show us where you're going. Perfect. I will draft that email right now. And then Miss Luna, you. would you like me to add you to that email or is it okay if I, or do you need to be CC'd on that as well? Yeah, go ahead and CC me. Two birds, one stone. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much for, for inviting um, Angel and myself.
Thank you so much for the information. I'm really excited. I think um, our residents will be able to really benefit from it. So thank you all for taking the time to come present to us tonight. And please um, thank you. the chat. I, their information is there in case um, you need it. Is Mel Young on the call? Yes, ma'am, I am on. Hi, so I just want to give kudos to Mel first and foremost. Um, she applied for a couple of the list grants. We had some working group meetings where we decided um, that this was money we wanted to go after and she was awarded a grant. So she's here to present, but I think I just want to send her some, some sunny side kudos and thank her for all of her hard work and congratulate her on starting this process. So Mel, I will give you thank control. You. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Hey, I'm trying to bring up my screen here in just a second. Okay. Screen, yeah. this is it. Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Melanie Young. I am also a Sunnyside resident, as well as a real estate developer in the area. Uh, I am also a technology consultant. Um, I did apply for um, a few grants and I was uh, awarded the Stop Illegal Dumping Campaign, but I just want to say that this is a win for the entire uh, neighborhood. Um, I have no intention on trying to carry this thing on my back alone. Um, I would like as much participation and involvement as I could possibly get. Um, and I, um, I also want to say that I, I did um, talk to a few people and organizations about it already, and I think we have the potential to make this a, a pretty big initiative um, and, and maybe an opportunity to, to clean multiple locations on um, the same day. So um, just to, to kick things off, um, the first meeting should be June the 26th, and I set that for Saturday. That way, um, just about anyone could participate, and it'll be on the weekend. And, and in that first meeting, we're just going to talk through some initial ideas that we talked through with the smaller group, um, but kind of um, give the larger community prebate to things that we're thinking about already and how we're thinking about execution. And what you're looking at right now is a landing page. Um, so this is going to be the tool used to collect volunteer information. So for those of you on this call, um, who would like to volunteer? Um, I would drop the. I'm going to drop the link in the chat um, so you all can fill it in. But also, please feel free to share um, this link. I have. I haven't shared it on social media just yet, and I will. Um, but feel free to fill that out. And I'm really looking for a personal involvement as well as on an organization level. So that's um, churches that are in the area, organizations that are in the area, business owners that are in the area, really looking to drive ownership of whatever area that you want to clean. So if there's a dump site near your church, if there's a dump site near your home, um, feel free to put that in um, this, this form and we'll start to survey that. And that's going to be a part of the meetings that we have. So we're probably going to meet maybe once every two and a half weeks, um, just to really plan through, pick some dates. But um, but yeah, that's a, that's about it. But really looking to really, really drive as much participation as I can, because if we can get, let's say, four to five sites cleaned in one day, that'll be a, a pretty major impact. And another part of the grant is to also deter dumping. So another leg of that is once we do clean up the locations, um, we're going to plant sunflowers um, in those locations that we're able to plant, you know, to try to uplift the community. And we're also looking for partners. Um, so I know I may um, pull Ivy in as a partner as well. Um, and I'm sure she, she has something uh, to present after this. So anybody with planning experience, you know, cleanup experience, feel free to, you know, just jump right in. So thank you, Mel. Um, we just want to thank those who, who've helped so far, Precinct 1, Don, District D. Um, and we all look forward to supporting these resident efforts. We hope that um, this is an ongoing process and that you can see how powerful Sunnyside can be when we join together. 
So next, we are going to have our design team presentation. So I'm going to start with just um, to preface the conversation. They were given a design problem by us, um, but there was a community engagement process that happened in which they talked to the community and determined site, um, scope. It was, it was really a community led design um, engagement. It was designing with the community rather than designing for. So these are one not funded projects. So today we're looking for ways, um, alignments in where we can start with implementation. So if you know of any partners that may be great to partner with, if you know of anyone or any entity with land that would be a great home for this, um, any alignments that you see, if you want to um, work with the teams and helping them take these things to the next level, that's also open. I'm really adamant about um, this amazing work being brought to reality. So they're gonna present their ideas with you today for your um, feedback and hopefully pleasure. <laughs> so I will hand the screen off to them. Not that I hold it right now anyway, but. And first we'll have the JC team, the Sunnyside team too. Go. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joaquin Vieira. I was a part of the Sunnyside Team One, JC. And, uh, you know, I'm a long term resident of the city of Houston. I grew up in Southwest Houston. I'm a graduate from the University of Houston and I studied architecture there, uh, community design. And I decided to really look into environmental resilience and, um, sustainable community design while I was studying there. So this is a really big passion of mine jumping into this project and it's been a wonderful opportunity to work with everyone. So we um, opened up this process with the Complete Communities Initiative by engaging the neighborhood and the residents uh, that were involved. We held a series of workshops where we got everyone's opinions on some of the problems that they wanted to address within the community through this design process. And uh, this was just a culmination of a lot of those conversations and where those ideas started to intersect uh, in terms of, you know, making generating change. So I'd like to hand it off to Siobhan, who uh, was also a part of our team to talk about where we began. All right, Siobhan. I, oh, hello. OK. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to figure out this mute situation. I'm in the office instead of at home like I usually am during these meetings. Um, but hello, everyone. My name is Siobhan Jennings. I work at a Houston firm called GLMV Architecture. I've been here for two years, and um, I'm a recent graduate of the master's program of architecture at U of H. And so like Joaquin said, um, I am one of the team members and uh, during our community engagement, we noticed three main concerns that were brought up. There are concerns over safety, food access, and the um, lack of usable green spaces within the Sunnyside community. And so we went and we um, took all of our data and came up with this concept of creating a green network within the community that has three major components of uh, public gardens, green corridors, and parks. And so looking at um, kind of the existing components of each of these and seeing how we can uh, design to reinforce those and add to um, add to the gardens, the, the corridors and the parks um, to really create a safer space, provide food and also create these more usable green spaces. And so going on to the next slide, um, all of these things will come together to create this green network um, that is centered around um, like food culture from 
getting community gardens and also using the design green spaces to mitigate environmental problems such as um, flooding and um, doing things such as adding lighting along street and shrubbery and greenery to uh, create these safer spaces. And so if we move on, we mapped out the existing resources in the community, broke it down into education, communal, and also the current green spaces. And uh, these blue dots everywhere are the churches and places of worship. Um, and so an idea that was thrown out was maybe partnering with different church leaders to um, get more uh, community gardens within the neighborhood so that people can have more access to fresh produce. Um, but then we also were looking large scale at the existing parks and green spaces in the community on the next slide. And so um, the Let's see. OK, so the large green area is where the solar farm project is located. Uh, and so for our design proposal, we focused on the adjacent property, which is the Sunnyside Park and Community Center. That is already an area that people are familiar with in the community. And so um, Joaquin is going to speak about ways that uh, ourselves and other members of the community have proposed ideas of how to um, make this a centralized part of this green network. Thank you, Siobhan. So we decided to look at Sunnyside Park specifically because of its proximity to the proposed solar farm. This solar farm uh, is, is in development now, and it's going to be the largest urban solar farm in the US. And so what that means for Sunnyside is that the US on a national scale is going to be looking at this community for answers when they're tackling these issues in other areas around the US. And it's going to be extremely important that we really think about the, the community as a network that's intersecting all of these different community assets and, you know, bringing um, a, a cohesive system that that works so we identified scott street reed and belford as some of the main corridors that we'd want to look at and redevelop in terms of the public right-of-way so a lot of the conversation that was happening just earlier today about sidewalk maintenance these issues came up in our workshopping uh, conversations with residents uh, about safety again students and and transportation to school those issues kept coming up. So we identified these three major streets as a place to sort of focus those initiatives and how they intersect with Sunnyside Park and the community center. The park was also identified by the Complete Communities Initiative as one of their primary points on their action plan. So we wanted to sort of overlap these um, efforts and really focus on ways on how we could redevelop Sunnyside Park so we started by looking at the park and its existing conditions. What were some of the amenities that the community really enjoys that's existing there? And where are some downfalls that we could kind of pick up in uh, you know, identifying areas of opportunity where we can really sort of introduce new assets to the park that would benefit all of the residents that utilize the space. So in the northeast corner, we noticed that there was a very large underutilized retention space. This is just open green space that we think would be a great opportunity for redevelopment. There's also a unactivated green space between two of the parking lots on the east side of the site. And we were looking at the south side of the site where the parking lot then opens onto a southern trail that leads directly to the public library that's in the neighborhood. So we thought that these were sort of gateways and areas of opportunity that we should focus our initiatives at when addressing some of the conversations that came up in our workshop. So in redeveloping, we created this sort of schematic plan where we've reprogrammed the park and introduced new elements to interface with not only the rest of the neighborhood, but with the solar farm that is proposed on the west side of the site. 
So we decided to expand the community garden on the north side of the site, uh, which would then directly interface with the, uh, a secondary community garden that's been planned to be incorporated in the solar farm. So this would create a centralized space for people to come for education on agriculture and where we could teach things like food security to residents where that are having to find themselves traveling outside of the community just for basic grocery needs. Uh, we also introduced a pollinator garden on the north side to create some street value and, and to bring in a lot of beneficial insects for the, the adjacent gardens. We're, of course, improving the lighting throughout the site. That was a big issue that came up in safety in the conversations that we were having with residents was that there wasn't a lot of lighting throughout the neighborhood and it made public spaces like parks and sidewalks uncomfortable to travel in the evening. So we really wanted to address that in our proposal. Something else that came up was accessibility to something as simple as a dog park. Residents were talking about having to travel outside of the community to be in an enclosed park where they felt safe with their pets and could let them go and you know enjoy this moment of recreation. They were having to travel 20, 25 minutes outside of their own community when we have all of this amazing space at the Sunnyside Park to utilize. So we're proposing an enclosed dog park between the two parking lots so residents can easily pull up into the space unload their pets, enjoy the park in an enclosed space and leave or enjoy the rest of the park as they please. But another really big issue that came up um, that we wanted to address was flooding and flood mitigation. The proposed site for the solar farm is a large undeveloped space with a lot of trees and a lot of wildlife plants. This naturally holds a lot of water from the community. So in a you know, flood event, a lot of the water is being held in that space. And as we're redeveloping that site and placing solar, um, solar panels and we're removing that natural vegetation, there's going to be a loss in water retention. And so a lot of that water will then begin to come into the community. We wanted to address that by introducing a constructed wetland on the northeast corner of the site. So constructed wetland is a man-made natural space that holds vast amount of water with native wildlife. And so it's a very attractive space that looks natural and wild. And our thought was that this could be, this could double as a space of recreation for residents that like to walk the nature trails during the day or in the evening but also as a, a retention space in a flood event. This can hold a large amount of water for the community and act as an environmental barrier to the neighborhoods. We wanted to extend that south along the walking trail to the neighborhood uh, library. And this is just an example of what a constructed wetland is in Houston. There's the Houston Ar Arboretum and Nature Center where they've built um, wooden walkways above retention spaces where people can just walk enjoy the space um, it's it's a beautiful recreation space and so just taking these images and quickly overlaying them on our site you can kind of begin to imagine what that could look like for the community as the recreation space it's it's beautiful it brings in a lot of natural wildlife uh, and vegetation but it will also really create this environmental equity in the neighborhood by protecting residents from a flood event. Now, one thing that's really great about this, um, this process was that we were meeting a lot of the residents in the community that already are pushing grassroots efforts on their own. We had some people speak at the beginning of our meeting today that are already organizing things like that. Uh, and one of the people that we've met was Ephraim Jernigan, who's the president of South Union CDC. And we learned about his stream summer camp that was happening this year. And so we decided to sort of partner with um, a professional co-ed fraternity at the University of Houston, Alpha Rokai, which I'm an alumni of. And they uh, focus on architectural and engineering networking. And so we 
brought in the chapter as well as all of the firms that are associated with our, our members. And we decided to workshop with some of the students that Ephraim is uh, programming with. And our first day went really well. What we did was we brought the site plan of the Sunnyside Park and asked them, how do they imagine this park being redeveloped in the future? What were some things that they wanted to see in their own community? And these are students ranging from early middle school to early high school. So we got a, a wide range of ideas from these students some with very cutting edge ideas, like including Wi-Fi towers and charging stations in the park. And I think it's extremely important that we involve our younger um, community members in this conversation because their perspective of the future is much different from ours. Yeah. Their ideas of technology and what could be is, is very different from what we deal with day to day. So the ideas that they brought to the table, I thought were invaluable and I really wanted to share them with y'all today. We completed this workshop just this Tuesday, so uh, we're going to continue to work with them throughout the program with Ephraim and Roy and see what other ideas they have for their own community. And I wanted to share those with y'all today. Some of those that overlapped with the things that we brought up was the, the dog park, uh, expanded playgrounds, they wanted to see public art in the park and a, a small performance space for public music festivals or um, shows. So it was really great to engage the students and, and hear their perspective about how they imagine their own community developed in the next five years. So what's important, you know, it's important that we engage everyone in this conversation because we're talking about the character of the community we're wanting to reinforce what's existing. And we took a look at uh, Scott Street specifically. This was just a quick collage of some of the imagery that you see driving along the street. We really wanted to kind of capture the existing conditions so we can then understand how to improve on them. So we were looking at the medians, which again, this is something that other residents have just brought up in this meeting today, is um, you know sidewalks, the, the condition of sidewalks, the density of street lighting, and you know how we can improve these elements and bring a greater sense of safety to the community without policing the community. I think it's a, important that we you know address safety in terms of environmental design standards so that we can um, so that residents can feel sort of safe naturally within the environment. Um, instead of introducing you know, more police officers and, and things like that. I think that should be the last initiative that we reach. Um, so again, we were just looking at the street conditions in section, understanding how it functions as a network and where we could improve. And what, some, what were some of the issues that came up in our conversations with the, the residents through our workshopping process? Uh, and, and lastly, one of the big issues was food, sec food security, so accessibility to grocery stores within the community. Um, we understood that there's a lot of amazing people already farming and tackling the food security issue on a grassroots scale, such as Ivy Leaf, and uh, you know we're very proud of the work that they're doing in the community. So we wanted to sort of introduce an idea of establishing a food co-op at Sunnyside Park. Um, and I'll give the, the floor to Kimberly, who will talk a little bit better, a little bit more on the co-op, as she set up one in another community and has more, um, more information on that. Thank you, Joaquin, um, and Siobhan for the presentations before. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting wicked feedback, so I'm trying to figure out the best way to not have that. Um, so you mentioned earlier about Scott Street and um, we know when we were looking at the plans, we understand that Metro is doing a boost corridor in Scott Street area and um, revitalization or enhancement of public transportation is such an important part of getting people to the space because we talked about uh, within the park, the um, 
people want to feel safe there, but they also want to feel safe getting there. And so we were super excited that um, Metro is focusing on the the Scott Street Boost Corridor area. Um, so one of the things that we did with this particular project that you see in front of you, Great Basin Community Food Co-op um, is, is now more than a decade old, and I was honored to help be a founding member of that. And we um, are now... Um, in in a place where um, we've been able to 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 be in this space for ten years and look back at how we could positively impact the community, and so we started as a tiny little five hundred square foot member community owned buying club, basically, and some of it was to connect the the locally grown produce, but also to provide better uh, food security and, and price availability on non-produce groceries to um, people in need, and especially those who were part of uh, WIC and other um, food enhancement programs. And so the co-op has grown from uh, a 500 square foot space to a 7,500 square foot three-story space that um, took over an old dilapidated um, uh, <laughs> building in downtown Reno, Nevada. It had uh, been vandalized. There were uh, a lot of security and safety challenges in the area backed up to the um, courthouse and the local jail. And so the neighborhood was um, really excited to see something happen there. So it gave us an opportunity to, instead of building something new, to come in and revitalize something that had kind of been forgotten by the community and really create a new community hub with this space. And we didn't even enter into the project thinking that we were going to necessarily address things like neighborhood safety and, and security and public transportation and lighting and all of those things. But that, those were the beautiful things that started happening from this project as it developed with the community. And so we hold, hosted numerous community workshops where um, we designed it specifically for the food types that that community was requesting. And then um, built it up with a lot of community input. Uh, for those of you on the call who, who have not participated in a co-op, it's, it's not a privately held business. This is member owned. Members work there if they have an opportunity to. If they don't have an opportunity to, they can still be a member and participate. Um, but it helps give an, an increased sense of ownership on the project, which is such an important part of a community initiative. And so um, it is now in um, its ninth year in this particular location. And at this location, as you can see, there's art on the wall. All the sides of the building actually have public art. And so when Joaquin was talking about um, public art and um, things like little free libraries and those kinds of things, which you don't see in this picture, is now a very well grown out teaching garden that school children come to and they get tours through to learn about medicinal plants and uh, alternative construction materials and all of those kinds of things. So this has become a school hub, uh, a community hub. This is also located in um, an area of three indigenous communities. So the Western Shoshone, the Paiute and the Washoe people also come here to gather because we have a lot of elders that um, do not have access to Wi-Fi and technology, which we also heard about earlier in the evening. Um, same challenges here. And so it has also become a community meeting space and a hub where people can find information if they don't have access um, online. And so what, what I just offered to the team was um, whatever knowledge I can provide on that, but the annual reports that you see on the side are just some of the really beautiful and, and, and deep ways that this one project that started as a buying club and has become this, this uh, um, space has been able to impact the community. And I think they've really beautifully quantified how they've made a difference in the community. And these aren't necessarily all the little touchy feely things. The seedling sale that you see in the lower left hand corner is an extraordinary event that people just can't wait 
to come to every year. And so as Joaquin was talking about how the, the solar farm is going to put this, this incredible new lens on Sunnyside for the rest of the country, there's an opportunity to show the rest of the country all the other incredible things that you all grow and make and do and create within Sunnyside that could be uh, displayed in, in a space like this. It is by and for the community. And that is the reason it is successful as it is, is because it's there specifically to serve the community. So I don't wanna take up any more of your, your precious time, but um, I will pass, pass it back off to the team, but I would be honored to help in any way that I can with a project like that. Thank you, Kimberly. So. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Go ahead, Siobhan. <laughs> so in in the sake of for the sake of time, I believe we can go to our last slide and David will explain about the ways we are trying to um, ensure that our steps for the future are going to be measured and calculated and be things that actually bring uh, positive changes in a measured way. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, so we, we've walked through a number of really super exciting design and, and opportunities that uh, we would all love to have on this project. And um, as Lindsay said up front, what one of the things we want to do is figure out how to actually make this happen. So on our, and on our design, we have committed to doing a full people profit planet analysis. And this is, this will use the same uh, powerful tools that leading uh, global architects use to figure out what the social, environmental, and financial impact is of different design alternatives and whether or not they bring a burden or or they bring a benefit to the community. Now, um, when we talk with community um, stakeholders, they had a number of desires that we've tried to incorporate into this. Unfortunately, uh, in the way these projects typically go, uh, people will huddle, they'll make a bunch of decisions, then they'll come back and say, well, here's what you got. And then the community really doesn't have uh, a, a lot of say after that. So we hope that we've got as much as we could. Here's the money that we had. So for this project, we're going to, to be very transparent about what exactly the benefits are along the social, environmental, financial impact. But we hope that this kind of plants a seed for Sunnyside because those same powerful tools used by global architects and, and municipal planners can be used as a lens on behalf of Sunnyside community inhabitants to look at what is coming into our community. Yes, we, we have little say over what the codes and minimum standards are for development, but we know what best practices are. And in my leadership uh, within the U.S. Green Building Council uh, Best Practices Committee, uh, through uh, my uh, co-chairing the S Texas Sustainable Best Practices uh, Council, we understand, we all know that we can do better. And if we can use a tool that is specific to Sunnyside, these are our concerns. These are the things that we need help on. And we can develop a tool like that that speaks specifically to Sunnyside. That would be a, a great uh, opportunity to jump off from uh, what we're doing in this design. So uh, something to think about, uh, something to help uh, bring all of this together and um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this evening. Thank you so much, David. Um, so we we just like to, you know, pass this along, open the floor for, for conversation or questions about anything that we spoke about this evening. There he is. Miss Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, it's Monica. Hi. Um, <laughs> I I wanted to um I guess kind of introduce myself again. Um thank you for the presentation. Um 
it it looks it looks pretty good. Um, it looks pretty pretty fancy. Um, you guys have a lot of good ideas. I'm the actual facility manager here at the park, so I wanted to introduce myself because I see there's been a lot of discussions and plans and ideas and and these focus groups. But this is all new to me. So I, I you know, and I've been here for almost a year now. So. I want to somehow figure out a way to like either bridge some gaps with you guys and um, you know it, it's my thing is it's it's one thing to be you know part of the community having focus groups and stuff like that but being here being in this building seeing some of our needs and our and our I'm sorry I can turn my, my camera on now I'll finish up, up some work just being a little bit more hands on may be something that can definitely help enhance what you guys are trying to do I mean like I say it looks great and all um what you guys are anticipating or what you desiring to do at the park but um as at some point we got meet so we can you know just make sure that everybody's kind of on, on that same page um and and lining with the the actual needs of the community um we we've been doing some reports and we've been doing some i'm trying to get some feedback from our seniors it'd be a great time to come during the day we're back open we have about 45 seniors that come here twice a week we have um, parents, we are summer enrichment programs open now. So we have parents of, we had about 40 kids here that's coming Monday through Friday. Those parents have some thoughts as well. So, I mean, anytime you guys want to stop by um, to get a little bit more information, a little bit more, um, I guess, hands on feel for, for what can enhance, you know what I'm saying? The inside, outside, around the building, um, just let me know. We're, we're, we're here all the time. Thank Thanks, you. No problem. The AIA initiative, I think you were looped in, but you're out of town. But that's why we have this presentation so we can start making those connections to further this. This gotcha. was done strictly with the community and anyone who was able to attend. It was a Saturday, a, a couple of Saturdays. So anyone who was able to attend. But yes, we they would. Well, I can't speak for them. <laughs> <laughs> we Come on down. Yes. Come on down. <laughs> to meet and um, kind of go over the proposal with you and, and discuss implementation and feasibility as well. Okay, sounds good. Tracy Stevens, I think you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, a couple of things. Uh, on the park design, uh, I didn't see anywhere on that where additional parking would be because right now after hours when there are youth youth games and practices and cheerleading that's going on there is no room to park uh part of the city of houston master plan for the parks uh we've been working on that for almost over five years to get adequate parking and some of that that you're proposing uh, doesn't show anything for additional parking. You want to add these extra spaces for people to come, but you are not providing off-street parking. There's no street parking here at all, so everything that has to be parked has to be parked within the city of Houston Parks property. Also, I would like to say that this plan that we're talking about here how does it coincide with the Sunnyside Turs plan, their master plan for what they're proposing uh, to develop down Scott, down Belford, down Reed Road? Uh, are y'all working together on, on this plan to see what overlaps, what, what they, they're wanting to do versus what y'all are speaking about? And the last thing would be uh, I've been talking with the commissioner, uh, Harris County Flood Control District, about connecting Sunnyside Park to the Margaret Jenkins Park, which is the Houston Parks Board major hike and bike trail. That is going to be the hub to connect our community to the bike and trail system for the entire Sims Bayou corridor. And also the new development that they're going to do at the hills uh, at Sims. And I didn't see anything um, on none of the presentations that included that as well. So uh, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there because we've been working on this for over five years, going on 10 years uh, with, with improvements to the park, even before the solar farm was brought back into the picture. 
because that was presented decades ago. They killed it, then they brought it back again. But improvements to the park we've been working on for, like I say, over five years, 10 years going on now. And I just wanted to know, you know, how, how, how does this go along with what the city of Houston's master park plan, they've already done. That's supposed to be trying to get funded and implemented. And uh, a lot of this, what you're talking about, you know, is good. But then a lot of it I don't see happening, you know, because there are other bigger issues that need to be addressed for the park and for the community. And I'm just wondering, you know, are y'all talking to each other? Yeah, so in response to Houston Parks Board, yes, the team was given um, all of the information and also Houston Parks Board did the presentation at our last design meeting. I just want to reiterate this study or this exercise was um, a dream as big as you can type exercise that happened with the community in conjunction with AA and NOMA. So we were trying to um, really push designers and the design community to design with the community and not design for. These are just initial stages. In terms of the TERS, they've been invited tonight, as well as we would love to have future meetings with them. These ideas are design ideas that came from the community meetings. They're not solid plans. And um, we the goal is to connect and all work together so we're not they're not presenting this to you as this is the final they're saying this, these are the ideas that they came up with based on the discussions that they had and um, some design implementation that they think would be beneficial for the community with the idea to further the conversation with all necessary parties um, that are interested in implementing a portion or the entirety of this idea and it doesn't have to also be Sunnyside Park it could be a different area if we if there was something the food co-op for ex instance if there's something in the design that we think would be a great tool to use and maybe this isn't the location but it could be used somewhere else in Sunnyside that's also to spur the idea so this is just to spur the idea to um, see these designs that were done on a volunteer basis, I'd like to reiterate that as well, and to to bring them further to implementation and to get your feedback on what what's needed, what's missing, um, who they need to talk to, what partners need to be at the table. Absolutely, and I wanted to thank you for for speaking up about some of the things that you're already working on and have been planning. It's important that these are brought to the table in this conversation so that we can kind of intersect all of these ideas and really define an action plan that's working for the residents, but is also something that we can, you know, genuinely push through and implement. So I, I appreciate you bringing up all of these issues and who those those uh, game players are so that we can make those connections and really push this discussion forward. So thank you for bringing that up. Also in the chat, Lindsay from RH, um, they have three questions and su suggestions as well. Have you met with Houston Parks Board to understand HPB's plan to connect Sunnyside Park to the Bayou? Example, e-bike stations, mobility improvements. Um, the second suggestion is there is there an existing friends <clears throat> of Sunnyside Park? And the last, are there any plans to create a business district such as Five Corners? One, in terms of Houston Parks Board, they, they presented at a meeting prior to the um, designing for impact. Um, we've not had a separate meeting with them. Uh, we definitely can can move towards that. And I think they're open to it. They're, they're really great partners and have really amazing things going on. Um, I am not privy to a Friends of Sunnyside Park. I don't, okay. If anybody else knows different, I don't. Um, and I, Right. So this is um, my name's Renee Hawk, and the reason I asked was um, I was I'm on the board of Friends of Lakewood Park um, in District K as well, and we didn't realize when we wanted to renovate the park, which it's finished, um, uh, that there was an existing little dusty bank account that you know some elders in the neighborhood had done and we were like wow okay cool um we also 
didn't realize we had such a gem in having an amazing um, after school program. So I think Sunnyside, I'm, I'm really excited to join the call. I'm in District K, I don't live in Sunnyside, but I'm so excited about like the, the solar farm and everything. Um, and uh, just, I'm just excited for the whole neighborhood. You know, it's really cool. And I love the idea when I saw that you guys were doing this. So I just thought, well, let me give some ideas what we ran into. Um, we found an existing Dusty Bank account with money in it and like nobody cared. <laughs> so um, that's something that you might think about forming would be, um, you know, for example, you would form a Friends of Sunnyside Park. Um, another thing, I don't know if I'm even on my camera. Um, another thing would be... Um, that we did work with Houston Parks Board, um, you know, as much as we could, and just trying to get the neighborhood excited and find out what they liked, you know, what, and, and it, oh my gosh, like when we renovated it, the, the neighborhood is filled. It's so beautiful to ride by and see everybody there, you know, and it brings safety to the neighborhood and it's just really nice. But utilize that after school program and talk to, of course, we, our biggest advocates were the, the park supervisor and like I'm, I was happy to see um, I don't know your name but the one who popped on and said you know ask us about it and see what activities are there but honestly the after school program is is a gem and that's what really got us I believe funded was you know for the kids um, and and utilizing that but definitely the park um, the park to buy you program like we now have an e-bike station there and it I just drove by and there there were two bikes there and it's like this huge you know bike station and there were only two bikes in this hot day so I was like wow <laughs> you know so just I just wanted to throw those out and also I didn't know I know that the proximity is a little bit far it's about seven miles to the district corner to um you know to district um or five Stop. corners district. but you might think about that getting the you know the business owners in in on that and creating your own district. Awesome. These are these are the, the kind of suggestions we love um, to hear. And congratulations on the success of your park. And thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to furthering this conversation. In the interest of time, though, I'm going to move to the next design team um, for their presentation. So we could see that. And this is not I just <laughs> We're not going to end these conversations here. Um, this is the first time some of you are seeing this and this some others may have seen this three or four times already or at least twice. Um, so we, we just wanted to reignite the, the conversation and I just wanna send a thank you to the design teams for all of their hard work thus far and their commitment um, to the community at, even after the initiative. So I'm going to pass it over to the next team, GSMA. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Pettigo, and I'm here with two other members of the GSMA team, uh, Anne Rosenwinkel and Andrea Ballandrain. Um, GSMA is a local architecture firm that's been designing projects for Houston, the Houston area for over 20 years. And we're passionate about the idea that good design is for everyone. And we are very proud of our award-winning affordable housing projects that have been completed in Houston. And you can see those on our website. Um, our team of architects and designers have enjoyed diving into the neighborhood of Sunnyside. We are grateful to have this opportunity learn more about our city and to work with one-on-one -on -one with other Houstonians who are devoted to improving neighborhoods. Our team encouraged the residents to share their visions and goals and we listened. GSMA hopes to encourage and inspire the flow of ideas by bringing pieces of the complete community's action plan alive and help make good things happen in Sunnyside. The big idea that we heard from the residents was the desire to nurture the economic sustainability of the current residents in Sunnyside by providing space for entrepreneurial retail opportunities. We wanna share with you our process 
and the ideas from the neighborhood and examples of how we think that some of these ideas could become real places. Anne, I think you're muted. Hi, good evening. This is Anne. Sorry about that. We first looked at the community action plan, the booklet that the you all put together and identified six priorities where we thought as architects we could have an impact. In the workshop, the community members considered these priorities and chose a retail center with amenities as the piece of work they felt would be most beneficial to the neighborhood. In further discussions about land and the economic realities of development, it became clear that the imagined shopping center with a big box store, movie theater, and bowling alley is 10 years or so down the timeline. And Lindsay, wearing her hat as community planner, reminded us all that the hope is that the economic growth and sustainability of the citizens of the neighborhood should mirror the blossoming of the land development. As an example, um, and you've kind of heard about this already from Joaquin, Ephraim Jernigan is working to train the youth of the community so that they're ready for the good jobs available during the construction of the solar farm. And that training is happening on installations at churches and so benefits the community itself. With that kind of model in mind, we looked again at the available land. Starting with publicly owned land and then looking generally at vacant lots, we see a pattern of large tracks and also smaller park pocket parks. I'm sorry, I got my pages mixed up here. So we see the large publicly owned uh, Old Bastion School site as a possibility. It's owned by HISD. And then the city owns two sites, um, the multi-service center, which uh, is going to be moved to another site. So that lot may be vacant in the near future. And then the Hope Farms actually sits on a site that's owned by the city. And then there are two privately owned large sites um, in the heart of the neighborhood. There's one at Cullen and Belfort. And then a big one where there used to be a shopping center north of uh, the South Loop. And um, there are also some interesting small tracks owned by the city that might be used for pocket retail sites. There, there used to be a lift station at Jarmy's and Coffee, and there's a little lot there. Um, there's a, some vacant land owned by the city across from the street from Hope, Hope Farms across Scott Street. And then there are three similar sites that are privately owned but seem ripe for some intervention. Um, there's the uh, agricultural hub, you know, that we're that we're all thinking about, and there are actually already plans for. And then adjacent to the McDonald's on the South Loop, there's a site, and there's a trapezoidal shaped site between Cullen and Calhoun on Briscoe. So the pattern of large and small tracks suggested a design proposal that addressed both conditions. We begin with diagrammatic configurations. The first is applied to one of the large tracks for retail center development, and the other could be applied to multiple small sites. Knowing that the community needs to take gradual steps to support a large, large box store, we envisioned a phased retail center. The first phase focuses on small scale retail and local restaurants on the ground floor with potential office or rentable small business spaces above. The parking is tucked behind the retail to maintain a strong walkable edge condition along the street. The street provides a generous, pedestrian-friendly promenade with ample green buffers to ensure the safety of the pedestrians. As shown in the section below, there are moments of outdoor dining that are elevated off the street to provide a protected area for visitors to linger. Thank you. The second phase expands on the existing retail and utilizes the adjacent property reserved for the future box store 
for temporary pop-up retail or farmer's market structures. Finally, the third phase includes the large box store or grocery store that the residents of Sunnyside desired. In order to provide retail solutions adaptable to various sizes of sites, we established six retail modules. Business over retail, business over restaurant, restaurant, coffee shop, pop-up retail lockers or stalls, and then the eventual box store. Next slide. Oh. Is that the same one? I'm sorry. <laughs> With the biggest retail module being the eventual box store, we also looked at temporary uses for such sites. Establishing a program like a drive in movie theater or a farmer's market before the construction of the box store will help increase traffic in the area and solidify the area as a community hub. Once the infrastructure is in place, a box store will be more feasible. A small intervention like a pocket park can utilize the coffee shop size module to anchor the outdoor space as a food truck park or a hub. This application only occupies a small footprint. And while it, it's small, it provides a local attraction to increase traffic. The pop-up retail farmer's market application utilizes lockers or stalls that would be rentable to local small businesses. The scheme is easily aggregated and can shrink and expand based on available land and demand from local retailers and consumers. This is the most flexible form of retail as it truly lets members of the community decide its character. Our goal is to provide a venue for citizens of Sunnyside to shape the physical and economic fabric around them. A ruled application of said pop-up retail shops is located in the city of Barcelona. Architecture Studio B720 has placed these units underneath a canopy for merchants to rent out and sell their products. So we'll try out these conceptual solutions on sites that are bookends of Belfort. One is, the, is large on the corner of Belfort and Cullen and right in the heart of Sunnyside. It currently is privately owned and leased out for agricultural purposes. And the second is the agricultural hub site across from the solar farm at Belfort and 288. And we're just going to, we know that there are big plans for that site, and we're just going to look at the eastern edge, a small pocket park type application. So these sites at what could be community gateways suggest a found opportunity to use the development to begin to suggest a language of wayfinding in the neighborhood that enhance both identity and the telling of history. There could be a tall clock tower and smaller kiosks that have storytelling embedded in the design, and there could be associated monument signs. Um, you'll see these components in our proposals for the two sites. For our large track solution, the proposal calls for an intervention on Belfort and Cullen. As mentioned before, we used a series of five elements varying in sizes to help activate the intersection. The different shapes and sizes of each of the volumes create both intimate and public spaces throughout the site with the smaller courtyards within the buildings opening up to the bigger green spaces. The smaller units along Cullen Boulevard are lockers to help bring in the local entrepreneurs to set up shop like an open air pop up retail. In between the two spaces of the market is a corridor for food trucks to come in and further activate the space. There are three main roofs covering the retail and market spaces underneath and have been given a generous overhang to help with shading the pedestrians. For the smaller site on the corner of Belfort and Canyon across the street from the future solar farm, there we go, we have taken a small corner of what is planned to be an agricultural hub for Sunnyside. The site includes a built structure 
with elevated patios and shading that creates opportunities for small businesses to open retail stores or provide amenities to the agricultural hub. And beside, it is a small food truck park. The opportunity is to create small interventions using the same elements to populate the many small sites scattered around Sunnyside. These destinations would utilize markers, program, and environmental language to weave the neighborhood together. By proposing retail opportunities at different scales and phasing the development of, these proposal, of this proposal and adding wayfinding ideas, we are creating destinations within the neighborhood. We're deeply grateful to have this opportunity to get to know and collaborate with fellow citizens of a city that we love. While we're keenly aware of the limitations of what we can provide, we hope our work will lead to important next steps, including negotiating with landowners fi and finding sources of fundings. Um, we, I see that there's representatives in this meeting from the TERS district and also from um, District D, um, and I hope that there might be some opportunities and we're open for conversations about how to come up with some funding and partnership for some of these ideas if the community is behind them and they want to move forward. And we're really uh, happy to hear about the receipt of the LISC grant for prevention of uh, illegal dumping. We were glad to support that effort and hope to continue in our involvement this summer with the kids in the STEAM camp. Um, I hope, Joaquin, that we can come and sit on juries or um, participate in whatever way you guys might need that help or some architectural expertise. <laughs> Anyway, um, we are open for any questions you might have um, at this point. Um, Melly, Mel, no, there, sorry. Mel, go ahead. I see you're here. <laughs> Hey, and, and and thank you for the support on that grant as well. Uh, my question is for the smaller site, what's the square footage of that? Like what's the ballpark square footage of that land space? Can we go back to, oh, let's see, here we go. So if you think about a car being about 20 feet, it looks like we have, um, maybe that's about three or 400 feet by the depth of the site. Okay. Maybe it may be bigger than that as drawn, but it wouldn't have to be bigger than that to provide a um, good space. I bet it's more like maybe, what do you think, Stephanie? So that'd be like, if you had a double row of parking, that would be um, about 60 feet. And it looks to me like there's about four of those. So yeah, maybe 400 square feet, linear feet along the street. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? No, but this is this is great. The last meeting that you guys had, um, I joined late, so I didn't get to see it. But to see it, this this looks awesome from all the input that we gave. You know, you guys really listened and implemented everything. So thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you. We have really, we, as we said, we really enjoyed working on it, and we did want to get a little that that closer up image of those lockers in Barcelona. We know when we presented this to the. Um, greater community in that four hour um, Saturday morning when all the architects presented, there were several teams that talked about these kind of retail, mo mobile retail pop up kind of things that we're talking about. And when we I asked the question of to the community's uh, members, what, how much they thought people could afford in rent, the answer was zero. So that's something to keep in mind as we think about how to develop these these sites, and that's why we thought these lockers might be a kind of feasible way to do it. That, that you know, there could be small, medium, and large versions, and they, if they're prefabricated, um, you know, it may be fairly inexpensive solution. The cheapest way to go is though the the mobile food truck concept. Thank you all so much. 
Um, I don't think there's any more questions. I'm just watching the chat. Again, these conversation. Oh, is this in? Sorry. There is something. Oh, what kind of fun do you give So, so I would. <laughs> can, can we can we ask uh, the people from uh, Shabazz's office? Do they know of any funding? Is Steven still on the line? Good afternoon, everybody. I lost my camera. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we are actively looking into funding opportunities for a lot of things in the uh, in the district, including Sunnyside. Uh, there is a tur currently at, an operation that we're aware of and are working with as well. Um, but uh, the council lady is a, a definitely interested in supporting uh, an idea such as this. Uh, I mentioned in the comments earlier, very impressive. Um, uh, excellent work on both of your parts. So uh, if there is anyone, I think I put my contact information in the chat already. I'd be more than happy to set up meetings or conversations, be they Zoom or in person. So uh, we're open to this. So uh, thank you. We'll be in touch. Yeah, we'll set the up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other comments? Um, I have a question. Are there any uh, current capital improvement projects that the funds could be tapped into for for this location? So the TERS is currently working on projects. I don't know if anyone from the TERS is um, still open, but um, they are very active and we will loop them in as well. But are there any CIP funds that are not allocated as of yet? Um, that I do not know. I don't think there's money just sitting. I think they're looking for ways to also plan future development. Well, I know that a lot of CIP projects have gone on hold. And there have been some for over 10 years that still haven't been implemented. So that's why I think I suggest taking a look, having your, you know, your representatives take a look and see what might be there. And even for, you know, flood control, um, you know, something like that. Um, we tapped into some of the existing capital improvement project funds that we hadn't even known about that, you know, that that's something to think about. Can I, I'm going to put my name and email in, and phone number in the chat. Um, if you would get in touch with me, I'd like, I really would like to hear about your experience. I think that's for RH. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sure. I'm just going to put that in the chat just to remind you guys <laughs> the CIP funds. No, thank you. We appreciate it. We, I'm very excited about these conversations and ideas. Um, again, these are not a one-stop shop. We will continue and I will keep pushing any way that I can. And if anybody has any other ideas or suggestions um, that they feel would be important or partners to bring to the table, please feel free. We really want to bring these designs or at least a um, stage of these designs to life. You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. If there are no more questions, we're going to hear now from the Healthy Houston Initiative at Prairie View. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. OK. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ian Kama Anyasinti. I am the program coordinator for Prairie View A&M University's Healthy Houston Initiative, um, initiative that was derived um, from the Cooperative Extension Program last May um, of 2020. So I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit today about what the Healthy Houston Initiative is, what we do, and the services that we offer. 
Okay, so like I mentioned, um, the Healthy Use Initiative derived from the Cooperative Extension Program here at Prairie View University, um, we have a mission to address health disparities and food insecurities while improving health, nutrition, and wellness in multiple communities in the greater Houston area. More specifically, we work with the 10 complete communities um, here, but we also work with Harris County. So even if it's a community not within the 10 complete communities, then we're still working with them if they're in Harris County. Um, we support the city of Houston's aim to collaborate with partners to strengthen neighborhoods so that all residents can have access to quality services and amenities. Um, we provide virtual and face-to-face -face activities, including our nutrition education, our 4-H and youth development, character development, um, finance, money management, telehealth screening, anything that can um, ultimately ultimately lead to long term healthy lifestyle changes and behaviors. Um, then the Healthy Houston Initiative has a program curriculum or community event for it. I always just to like to show the 10 communities and the complete communities and then also Harris County. So these are the um, areas that we're serving right now that, or we have programs running right now. OK, and then our goals. So the goal of the Healthy Houston Initiative, we have four: expand awareness of nutritional and health services available to families, um, improve healthy self care practices through screenings, assessments and referrals, um, provide workshops and educational opportunities focused on parenting and family support um, and improve access to healthy foods. And so the way that we um, go about achieving these goals is through our um, our community programs, as well as our workshops, our volunteer events. Um, and then we also have our mobile kitchen unit. I'm sorry, I was trying to load this page, but our mobile kitchen unit um, that is fully stocked. We have the burners, we have the refrigerator that we are using to do live food demonstrations in communities. We're big on agriculture and natural resources. So what we like to do is go to community gardens in the area and show how to make a recipe from something straight from the garden. Um, the other day we were at Highland Heights Elementary out in Acres Home, and so we um, planted sweet potatoes and um, bean sprouts and um, tomatoes. And so what we do is we take those fruits and vegetables from the garden, we take it to our mobile kitchen unit, wash it off and do a, a live food demonstration on recipes on healthy eating with those items. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the programs that we offer. So we cater to youth, children, um, students, adults, and seniors, all ages. Um, this first portion is describing our youth programs that we offer, which is Heroes for Healthy Houston, um, engages youth in a healthy lifestyle. Um, this is more so of an ambassador program where we, where we go in the schools and we teach this program to the students so that way they can be an ambassador and engage their peers into healthy eating and physical activity. Igniting Sparks, which is one of our most famous programs, is where we teach the students to take their passions and things that they're interested in and turn it into um, an entrepreneurship opportunity. Um, then we have Operation College Access and Welcome to the Real, Real World. These are preparing students for life after, um, after high school, um, getting them to start thinking about finance and budgeting and uh, money management. And they really do enjoy these two um, courses because we do it in a way that engages them and not um, put limitations or restrictions on their thoughts of money management. The next we have CASP, which is our um, community agriculture and school sustainability program. So for this one, like I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of community gardens within schools, um, community centers. We can do churches um, anywhere. There's a community garden, then we can come to either reconstruct, revitalize, restore, um, or just start from the from the ground up for that community garden. And so this program, after we've implemented a community garden at a school, we do a sustainability program because a lot of times we do have community gardens that are built, um, but then there's no sustainability plan in action. So there's no maintenance upkeep. So this program teaches students um, all, and the ins and out, everything that has to do with a community garden as well as um, where your food comes from. They learn about agricultural literacy in this program. And then we have our nutrition education classes. Since we're um, teaching on nutrition and healthy eating to ultimately, like I mentioned, um, increase lifestyle changes and behaviors associated with eating healthy, we have a taste of African and Latin heritage um, where we take foods from these two diasporas and we teach them the history um, on these foods, how to cook them, hands on experience, um, and just a fun lesson for the students, especially within the school systems. This is a program that they really like. Um, another one is Chef, 
this one is an eight week course where we teach um, healthy eating and recipes to preventing childhood obesity, um, things such as why we should drink water and milk instead of, you know, sugary drinks and sodas. And then we have EPNIP, which is our expanded food and nutrition education program. The great thing about EPNIP is they work re really close with families and youth to cultivate um, a nutritional eating plan that works for their families. So this one is for parents and students to do at the same time. Um, we offer this program during the school day or after school as well. So that way we can ensure that the parents are there to be there with the students. And so I know I just um, went through all the programs pretty quickly, but um, ultimately I just wanted to talk about the Healthy Houston because we have all of these programs um, locked and loaded. We have agents and specialists in the county that are here to serve these programs to the residents in the communities. So we wanted to just know, let the communities know that we're here, um, we're available, we can do a customized plan with um, a school, with a community, community center, with the organization, with the church, um, any way to get these programs out there. That is what we're here to do. And I just wanted to provide my information and leave the floor open for any questions. Are there any questions? And just yeah. Ms. 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 Yeah, hi. yeah, this is a very interesting program. Um, about a year ago, I took over our health ministry. And this mm -hmm. past weekend, we had our first uh, Zoom health seminar. And it was very, it was well accepted. And we got rave reviews for our first one. And we've got many to come. And I'd like to work with you to see, if we, well, we're in Sunnyside, my church. And see if we can maybe work with you guys to incorporate some of these programs that you have because we do have Hispanics coming to our church. I'm, a, I'm at a black Catholic church where we've got a lot of Hispanics popping up here and there. And so the fact that you offer both the African and Latin um, studies there, I, I think that's a good thing. And um, I'd like to talk with you some more about that. I, I took your information down, but yeah, I'm pretty excited about the things that you're doing. I think they're well needed for the students. Yes, most definitely. And I'll put my information in the chat as well. And like I said, our programs are very customizable. So um, we would definitely like to collaborate with your church. And I'm a PB mom alumni. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got one of those PB engineers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a question in the chat. Are these services free of charge, grant covered, or payment provided by the partner partnering organizations? Yes, so they are free of charge. We are grant covered um, through the Texas A&M system and the chancellor, the Texas State Chancellor. That is where we receive our funding for this, um, for all of our programs and events. So just contact them. They just need people <laughs> in place and they can work yeah. with um, Dorothy Ashley asks, are you adding communities to your list? Yes, so I know we just outlined the 10 communities, but we can serve any community in the Harris County um, in Harris County. So if your community is, lies within Harris County, then yes, we can serve you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, also be on the lookout. There should be some healthy Houston activities happening in Sunnyside in the very near future. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you. Ivy, is Ivy on the line? Hello. Hello. Yes. Did you say Iva? Ivy. But if you have a comment. Oh. No, I, I don't. Thank you. I just heard my. I heard you say Iva. Um, oh. It's Iva, but some people say Ivy, so I wasn't sure. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay. So we are going to move on really quickly to. Um, 
So Healthy Houston will actually be at this event. There is a watermelon patch that is happening at Ivy Leaf Farms um, on Juneteenth from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There's house plants, there'll be vendors there, family fun, farm fun. You can RSVP online at ivyleaffarms.com and just go to the events tab. So if anybody is interested in that, please feel free to stop by. And we will have our, um, so I just wanted to add, we'll have our mobile kitchen unit there tomorrow, or I'm sorry, on Saturday, and we'll be doing a live um, food demonstration on the farm. And Next, um, is there anyone from Worthing on the line? Hey, good evening. Hi. Uh, so on this Saturday at Worthing Early College High School, we will be hosting our uh, vaccination event. It is open for any student uh, ages 12 and up. Uh, we will be uh, distributing the Pfizer vaccine we have uh, roughly a thousand um, vaccines that are available. Uh, they'll also be given the Moderna if they're adults uh, that have had that um, already. This is primarily for the first dosage, but if you have already have taken the first dosage, uh, just bring your card and they'll give the second dosage. Uh, we'll have food trucks, uh, prizes. Uh, really uh, key thing is for any uh, students that attend Worthing um, will receive an opportunity to get a free full paid scholarship to an HBCU. Uh, we're actually giving out, it's gonna be two of those, and this is uh, co-sponsored by the NAACP um, and Dr. Gatt's office. Uh, and so if you need any details, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I do encourage everyone, if you have uh, relatives, uh, children, uh, as they're getting ready to prepare to return back to school in the fall, uh, and they're, they're already of age 12 or older, go ahead and you know push forward with getting the vaccine uh, so that we can safely get back to the school year on in the fall. Uh, thank you. Lindsay, you're muted. My apologies. Ephraim, are you on the line? Thank you, Ms. Uh, Principal Hare. Awesome. Hello, Lindsay, everyone. Uh, I've been cutting grass, so I'm just taking an opportunity to cool down. But a uh, great presentation from everyone. Yes, the STEAMS uh, summer camp is off to a wonderful start. Um, we've driven uh, zero turn lawnmowers. We did some tractor work today. It's just, it's just, I'm, I'm kind of excited. So really it's gotten off to a good start, but we really want more kids from the community uh, involved. Right now there's about seven kids from Sunnyside. Uh, we have kids from all over Houston, but with all the activity that's happening that we're trying to pitch to students through the camp, we would really like to have more kids from Sunnyside involved. Um, but tomorrow is fun day and we have horseback riding set up as well as a little bit of Juneteenth. Uh, so it's just very exciting. Uh, I think I'm having more fun than the kids, but it's just great. Love to have Worthing and Addicts and uh, all the, the schools involved. Uh, we had U of H. I uh, see Joaquin was on the line. Uh, they did a design build presentation that the kids just really fell in love with. Seemed like everything we're pitching at them, they're just eating it up, enjoying it. And so it makes you want to wake up in the morning and do it all over again. So we have five more weeks and anyone's welcome. We uh, try not to go over 40 students and right now we're hovering around 25. So we got a lot of room to grow. Uh, if you like to uh, have a kid in the program, just reach out to me. Uh, the information's on the flyer. Love to have you. Thank you, Linda. 
No problem. Can you actually, there's two questions. One, can you drop the information um, in the chat? So anyone who would like to get in touch with you or on your website can lo log on. And you can donate also to sponsor a student if that's something you're interested in. Um, I think there's a link for that as well that Ephraim can drop. And someone asked, is the camp free? Uh, no, uh, the camp's really not free, uh, but we have some donors that are supporting our kids in need. So just bring that to my attention and we can get that kid taken care of. There was another question. Can kids attend as early as tomorrow? Yes, they can. All they, tomorrow's fun day and as many kids as show up to have fun. Uh, it's just so much set up on these Fridays to where I just really hope they would come out. Uh, we, I'm just kind of giving things away, but uh, we have uh, U of H basketball teams coming to uh, do some horse. Uh, we got a nice size parking lot, so we'll be playing horse. And then uh, we have four foot tortoise turtles that's going to race across the parking lot. I can't wait to that Friday. Uh, but anyway, it's just so much excitement. I feel like a kid again. So anyone's welcome. We're at 4818 Higgins, 77033, and we operate from 9 to 3. Thank you. No questions. I don't see anything. Meals yes. are, by the way, first. Yes, uh, meals are provided thanks to Houston Food Bank. And so, uh, but tomorrow we actually gonna teach kids uh, the art of cooking wieners. So we're gonna be teaching them how to use three different forms of smokers. A uh, simple on up to how to do a brisket. So a little bit of everything is in this STEM camp. Wonderful. Uh, last question, and there was a question, can adults attend this camp? Most definitely. Uh, we're preparing sunny side for what's coming. That so, was a joke. Oh, <laughs> really, it sounds there, so fun that I want to go. But there are a lot of adults that instead of dropping their child off, they're staying. And we welcome it. Um, so anyone's welcome. Wonderful. So Evan, if you could drop that information in the chat, that would be really helpful of how they can contact you or how they can um, attend camp. OK, I'm going to drop my email. Just uh, email me and uh, we can make contact that way. OK, thank you. So thank you all for sticking in. Um, the Houston Public Library also has some pretty exciting updates, so I am going to pass off the screen. And let. Teresa share. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Teresa Lopez. I am the branch manager at the Johnson Neighborhood Library. Uh, we have some exciting news. Uh, we officially opened on June 1st. Uh, we were limited uh, browsing for a little while, but now we're fully open with uh, some safety procedures, of course, but everyone is welcome to come and use the library, check out materials, use the computers, uh, check out hotspots, laptops. Uh, we have all sorts of services available. We continue to offer service by appointment in the different technology access at Tech Links. Uh, uh, you can also restart interview rooms and we also still have curbside available so you can make your appointment online and you can reserve your books online and just pick them up drive by and pick them up or you can come into library if you like uh, these are the lo locations that are open we're open mondays 12 to 7 tuesdays and thursdays 12 to 5 wednesdays fridays and saturdays 9 to 5. Uh, we th this is the website for the virtual rooms and the different libraries that have this available. Uh, we do not have this at Johnson, but if you like the closest library to Johnson is Smith and you're able to reserve a room there. 
Uh, we also have access to special coll collections libraries, and uh, a lot of people do not have uh, this kind of information. They don't know that these places are available. We have the Houston Metropolitan uh, Research Center, which is which houses photographs, documents, maps, bu building plans, journals, oral history and books uh, for the study of the Houston history. We have the Clayton Library. Uh, with houses genealogy uh, research materials and the Gregory School, which preserve, promotes, celebrates the rich history of African uh, of African Americans here in Houston. Okay, um, these are this is the website for the tech links. We have two tech links available uh, in Cinewood Regional Library and in Dixon. So I just wanted to make this available as well. And these are the different uh, safety procedures that we're still following. Uh, temperature screening for anyone aged two years and up needs to be done prior to entering the library. Uh, we're still encouraging six feet uh, between customers and staff. Masks are not required, but they're encouraged. So that's a personal decision. Hence, the sanitizing stations are available and computer stations will be sanitized by staff after every use. Uh, all items uh, as of now uh, or handled by customers will be quarantined for 24 hours. So if someone turns in their materials, uh, their, their items will stay in their account for 24 hours. OK, if you have any further questions, you can call 832-393-1313 uh, and they'll provide you with more information regarding uh, safety protocol. Um, I just wanted to give out this information as well. As I said, we have hotspots available. We have the complete communities hotspots available as well. Those are able to be checked out up to three months. So if you need internet for your home, you're more than welcome to come to the library. Uh, if you have a library, a library card, it's it's like checking out a book. And if you uh, if you um, if you don't, we can help you to get your library card. All you have to do is come to into the library. We have many hot spots available, and you can check them out on the spot. Uh, we also have uh, borrow a laptop. You're also able to reserve a laptop. Those are in high demand, so uh, you will uh, go into a waiting list, but uh, just FYI, they're, they're still available as well. Okay. Um, and you can go to the HoustonLibrary.org to place holds. And uh, all you have to do is add your library card, your PIN, choose the location, which uh, Johnson is available for Sunnyside <laughs> and go pick up your your material at the library. This is the website for technology, uh, HoustonLibrary.org slash technology so that you can look at all the different resources that we have, which is plenty. Um, like I said, we have the curbside by appointment and um, anyone can use this resource as well. And Hotspots, hotspots, hotspots. That's my main <laughs> thing right now. If you need a hotspot at your home or you need it for for a program or the different events that you will have in the neighborhood, come to your local library and check out a laptop. Uh, I mean, a hotspot. And we have, like I said, we have them available right there on the spot. We are also having the summer reading program, Tales and Tales. Uh, it's going to be from June 1st all the way to August 15th. And you can go to HoustonLibrary.Beanstack.org and you can uh, register your children and they will get great prices with this as well. And it will encourage them to, um, to read more, of course. And there are many events that they're planning as well. Uh, as of right now, we only have virtual programming. Uh, in Face-to-face uh, -face programming is still not available. But uh, we are working on that and it's soon to be announced. And of course, this is the website for our neighborhood. Everyone is welcome. Like I said, the virtual events will be on the site and everyone is more than welcome, you know, to go into our website and check it out. And if you see any programs that you're interested in, you're able to to uh, view them there as well. Or give us a call. We'll be more than happy to to answer all of your questions. 
and thank you so much. I appreciate that, <laughs> the time thank that you've given me. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions? The Hotspots Initiative is very exciting. So, internet service provided by your public library for up to three months sounds like a pretty good deal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we just opened, so uh, a lot of people are not aware of that, those kind of services that we have available for the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Are there any other community announcements or updates or anything else that um, you guys would like to say before we jump off? Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I'll, I will make sure I email out um, resources and contact information, as well as this recording will be placed on Let's Talk Houston, and you'll get an email of that link as well. Um, oh, Mayor Hines is on. I think she's just on the chat, but she wants to say thank you to all that attended the Sunnyside Energy Trust Employment and Resource Fair. It was a success. Um, I think it was in... I know it was on the news, but I think it was also may have been in the Chronicle. Thank you for that. Does anyone else want to speak? Um, the Juneteenth Texas Sunny Texas Sunnyside is Saturday, June nineteenth at. 11 a.m. at Metro CME, located at 8955 South Freeway. So there's a Juneteenth celebration happening at Metro CME this Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. And that's in the chat. All right. Well, if no, we don't have anything else. Um, feel free to drop things in the chat. Again, you'll get a follow-up email with me. Thank you again to all of our presenters. Um, thank you to our design teams. We have a lot of exciting meetings to set up and line up. And thank you for all of our elected officials, our department um, representatives, um, the team, planning and development team, and the most important part of this, the residents and the stakeholders. Um, thank you for continuing to um, make Sunnyside a, a really amazing community to work with. So. With that, I'm going to let you all get have your evening. <laughs> Bye. Have a good one. Oh, Bye. the best way for residents to be notified would be um, signing up for the newsletter. And I'm going to drop that link in the chat really fast. But if you go to let's talk Houston.org and go to the Sunnyside community, you can sign up for our newsletter. And I communicate all meetings and things through that. Or you can get on Let's Talk Houston and also um, sign up to be on a working group for a particular area of interest. Thank you all. Great meeting, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your help. Oh, no problem. Don't forget to stop the recording. <laughs>